good. Okay. Uh, well, I, I just want to welcome everybody here. I'm Nancy Bass Wyden, uh, the owner of The Strand. For a little bit of history, my grandfather founded the store 92 years ago. It was uh, part of Book Row, which was an area that was uh, 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 went along 4th Avenue from Astor Place to Union Square. And at its height, there were 48 bookstores. There were all used bookstores. And we moved um, toward kind of the demise of it in the 1950s. We moved over to this location. Um, and the all of Book Row kind of disintegrated disintegrated except for us and I just want to thank everybody you know for being such voracious readers and supporting our family-owned business um, I don't usually give author introductions but tonight I wouldn't miss it um, my deceased uh, father-in-law the author Peter Wyden was a special pal of Terence the, uh, they met when Terence was reporting on the collapse of the Soviet Union for the Associated Press in in Germany I understand after that there were many discussions and meals that followed that involved um, sausages and kraut and many steins of beer. Uh, Terence acknowledged even in tonight's book um, that Peter was a special and valuable presence watching over his, his shoulder, so thank you for that. Um, our family became reacquainted with Terrence when he uh, became the AP News editor in Oregon um, in my husband, Senator Ron Wyden's home state. Um, according to Ron, nobody knows more about the Wydens than Terrence Petty, who wrote um, beautiful obituaries for both Peter and um, my mother-in-law and my husband's um, brother, so th thank you. For for that. Uh, maybe we should talk about the book a little bit now. <laughs> you can talk about Peter all you okay. Want. <laughs> well, last night I was sitting in bed and I was um, going to read this book and I was kind of dreading it because I thought I just want to read something escapism. But um, I, I dug in and I stayed up all night reading this. I mean, it was captivating and such a timely book and I love your writing in it. And you wrote um, about Hitler just off the plane, standing before the crowds on an election rally and talking about the lying press. And in today's world, of course, filled with autocratic leaders, the truth is never more essential. So joining Terrence to it, discuss the book is John Danzisky. Danishevsky. Danishevsky. <laughs> the, um, he's the associate press uh, vice president um, for standards and editor at large. Dan's career has seen him posted across Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and Asia. He sat on the he sits on the Pulitzer Prize board um, since 1913, and last night he said he awarded all the all the prizes. So um, please, 2013. <laughs> for 2019. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming two committed and relentless journalists, Terrence and um, John, to The Strand. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Terry, it's great to uh, be with you again after all these years. Um, we worked together closely when I was in Poland and you were in Bonn and you would come over and we uh, were there for that very exciting period when uh, communism ended, uh, or we thought it had. And, um, and then you've written this very uh, timely book, as Nancy said. Maybe I thought we'd start just by talking about how you came to write this book. Thank you, John. Uh, first off, I know pretty much everybody in this room, so thank you for coming. And there's just an, an amazing depth and breadth of journalism in this room. And I'm going to name you because you deserve to be named. John, of course, Dave Curry, Dave Woodward, <coughs> various times I've received. Julie Rubin, the AB. Uh, Marcus Lyson, also a uh, former foreign uh, correspondent for these people. Right. Right. That's called the border is. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. Uh, Randy Hershaft. <laughs> uh, Randy Hershaft, uh, you might fit into the next Cold War. I'm not, I'm not certain. You've been at this for about 30 years, so you probably slide in there somewhere. Um, Randy is a, uh, a researcher, 
Um, he's just a whiz when it comes to doing um, uh, story investigations, and I look forward to working with Randy in the future. Um, and did I miss anybody? Um, Dick Winfield, whose um, uh, daughter Nicole is the AP bureau chief in, um, in Rome, and Dick used to be um, the attorney for the Associated Press. And Peter Costanza, without whom this book would not have happened. Um, and Drew the Moniker, did I get the last name correct? <laughs> Who is John's, John's wife? And, um, and Drew the is with Penn, Penn your title? Yes. She's with Penn America now and a uh, former foreign correspondent. And I'd like to introduce also um, uh, Douglas Morris, who's uh, an attorney um, in uh, New York City. And uh, Douglas wrote a book um, about the um, uh, attorney, um, a, um, uh, a Jewish German. His name is Max Hirschberg. And Max Hirschberg um, defended the Munich Post in multiple uh, lawsuits that were brought by Hitler, um, other, other Nazi officials. And Hirschberg also defended the Munich Post in this huge, spectacular trial in 1925. Was it the... Uh, it's called the Stab in the Back Trial. Uh, so um, Douglas wrote this, this book, and uh, uh, his book uh, made one, uh, uh, one, of, one of the chapters of my book uh, possible. It's called Stab in the Back. So thank you for coming, Douglas. Um, family. We have family here. Uh, my, uh, uh, my wife and uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my guide and, uh, and all things, Christina, and a, my cousin who lives in New York City, uh, Rosario. Um, and those are the people I know. And just walked in, Tony, Tony Chuska, who worked with me in, uh, in Bond for a couple of years. And he's now with Bloomberg. Good to see you, Tony. Hi, Tony. Um, so now that we're, I've introduced everybody. Um, so the, um, this book goes back, actually, um, to my days when I was working um, in Germany. I was based in, uh, based in Bonn. And in 1995, um, there were um, uh, a series of reunions at uh, former concentration camps uh, across Germany. Um, first one was at Dachau, this one at uh, Buchenwald, um, Ravensbrück, and these were all sponsored by the, uh, by the German government. Um, and so I, I covered, covered these um, reunions and the, um, uh, the very sad celebrations. When I was there, um, I heard about um, the Munich Post. I really didn't know anything about it. Um, and I read in a uh, German publication, there was actually an editor who's still alive who worked for the Munich Post, and so I thought I'd look him up. And so this would have been in the spring of 1995. I went to his apartment, um, found out where he lived, and he let me in. He's very nice, but he was completely incoherent. Um, he was in his 90s or so, and I was very frustrated by it. I just, I just let it go, and I went back and I covered the, the Dachau um, Memorial. Um, a co couple years after that, um, a, um, uh, a fellow, um, I forget his last name here, he wrote a book called um, um, Explaining Hitler, Ron Rosenbaum, I think was his name. And he had a chapter, his chapter three was titled um, The Poison Kitchen, and it was all about the Munich Post. And I read that chapter, and I was just mesmerized. And he named the editors um, of the Post, and he described um, the things that they did. He described... Um, documents that editors of the Post had uh, had gotten. I mean, these the, the editors, the way he described the editors, were like it made you really made you think of Woodward and Bernstein. This is exactly how Woodward and Bernstein operated, um, meeting shady characters and taking documents from them. Uh, sometimes buying documents, which you're not supposed to do. Um, and so he wrote this spectacular chapter, and I read it, and I said to myself, and 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 he had also encouraged. He had a challenge at the very end of that chapter. Um, he said that um, um, I would wish that um, uh, some German journalists would take this up and um, write a book about this and write about the Munich Post from the point of view of one of the one of the um, uh, one of the editors. And so I read that and I thought, yeah, I'd like to do that. So I spent several years actually um, made a trip, a research trip to a um, uh, couple to uh, Germany and. Uh, uh, visited the Bavarian uh, State Archives, a just terrific gold mine for uh, for records, uh, Munich City Archives, um, and you would know those from the, Douglas from the uh, um, all the terrific court documents at the Munich City Archives, um, and uh, so it's been about 
uh, a month straight and reading the uh, the Munich Post newspaper as well. And uh, that was um, um, that's the origin of my interest in it. The book itself, um, uh, a few years ago, and Peter, you can correct me if I get this wrong. A few years ago, uh, Amazon was starting up a new imprint called uh, Amazon Original Stories, correct? And they approached um, uh, Peter to see if there were any um, AP journalists who had any books in the work that, that might might fit with this 10,000 uh, 10, word um, nonfiction piece. Um, so I pitched my piece and uh, Peter sent it to um, Amazon and they, they picked it as an, as an e-book. Um, so it got published as, as an e-book last December um, and then um, we went ahead with um, the, the, the paperback uh, which is substantially longer than the, than the e-book and has a lot more information and photos. So, um, and that's, that's, that's <laughs> yes, it's um, it's a very uh, uh, good read, and it does have all those uh, famous archival photos from from the AP archives. So, um, I, this was really kind of a labor of love for you, and I. I I could appreciate having lived in Germany uh, from 1987 to 1997. There was something about the country that that really uh, stuck stuck with you, and uh, almost a longing to to imagine what Germany might have been like if Hitler had never happened. Um, what? What would be your response to that? Was that part of the motive for the book? So the reason I joined the AP in um, uh, 1902, just kidding, um, 19, um, Christy, remember? You're the 1980, 1980 actually, uh -huh. uh, was because I really wanted to go to Germany. I would uh, studied uh, German German history, um, and I just, for some reason, I had the book. And like a lot of people, I wanted, I wanted to know why. I just had a lot, and I don't have any German blood in me whatsoever. I'm, French, Canadian, and, and English. Um, so that's a puzzle. It had nothing to do with Hogan's Heroes whatsoever. Um, and uh, so it, um, so I wanted to understand why, and that was a, a driving force really for me wanting to get to Germany. And I met Nate Polowetsky and, and he, well, you did too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, so when I, when I went to, to Germany, I had a lot of, um, um, a lot of questions. Um, how did it happen? How could people, who, who were the people um, who let it happen? Um, who were the who were the sons and daughters? Who's the next generation um, of those people who let it happen? What what do they think of it? So I just had all these questions um, uh, swirling around in my head. Um, and there are a number of people, journalists in this room, who've been there, and they have they've had encountered they've had the same questions. Totally, I know I know that you have. Just how how did this happen? Um, and, and quite honestly, um, after. 10 years, I, ha I felt like I had a really good, after 10 years, I had a really good understanding of, of Germany. But I actually came back with more questions than, than answers, I have to say. I do. And, and writing this book was um, an attempt to take one slice of this, this area where I still had questions, and that, that actually being the um, uh, Weimar era, which is completely um, overlooked um, these days. Well, I, I want to get on to the Munich Post and, and those, those incredible journalists. But before we do, let's talk a little bit about the, the Weimar uh, period and also a Munich that I wasn't aware of, Bohemian Munich. What, it sounds like it was crazy there. Uh, uh, yeah, if, um, if you like to, uh, uh, the idea of uh, kind of a, uh, a free life. I mean, it's, it's very, my understanding of it uh, when I, I and I read a lot about the uh, um, the people who lived there, the uh, the artists um, um, who lived there, and it seemed to me that as, as I was reading it, um, that it was a lot like uh, '60s America, <laughs> really. You know, the idea of uh, of free love and just having total 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 freedom and uh, in your, in your life. lots of partying, uh, a lot of very intelligent people. I mean, there's just uh, Munich at that at that time was just. Um, Bursting with uh, with with creativity, uh, very famous um, artists. Really. Very famous artists, yeah. And and one of the the editors um, lived in the arts district called uh, called Schwabing, uh, Julius uh, Zerfas, and he lived that life. Um, and he wrote an, an essay uh, about it called uh, called Schwabing, and it was a very moving essay because he describes Munich in those days, how 
uh, fun-loving it was um, for, for several years. And then World War I starts, and then the Nazis come along, and everything changes. Mm -hmm. And um, the, um, the uh, beginning of uh, Hitlerism uh, emerged right after the First World War, even amid all this fun-loving freedom. And, uh, yes. So the, the fun-loving freedom, um, um, so there, there are a lot of, um, uh, there's a revolution happening in, in Germany and uh, across Germany after um, um, Germany's defeat in, in World War I. Um, there was a rebellion in um, uh, Berlin, uh, various cities across Germany, and there was a, a major one in, uh, in Munich that actually um, toppled uh, the uh, Bavarian king, and there was a, um, a Soviet republic, actually a Soviet <laughs> Uh, a Soviet-style um, government was um, uh, installed in Munich for, uh, for a few months in 1919. And um, government forces moved in, and there was, uh, there was bloodshed on the, on the streets. And so, um, you know, my reading of what happened um, during that period is that there is so much um, bitterness after the fall of this uh, uh, the Soviet-style uh, government. There had been so much... Uh, bloodshed that people um, in Munich, they went in the other direction. They went in the far right direction. They, they, were, they were fed up with, uh, with, with leftists. Mm -hmm. I see. So the Munich Post uh, was uh, a party organ of the Social Democrats. And um, even uh, long before um, uh, Nazism and emerged as a force or far right, it had been standing up for uh, human values and, and you even against uh, German colonialism in Africa at a time when I imagine that was not very popular. Um, uh, how, how do you think its uh, political affiliation and its uh, commitment to human rights came about in that era? Um, the Social Democrats, um, they've always had kind of a um, progressivism. Um, that's, that's what's defined them. Um, but they were actually split um, for a while in the uh, uh, early 1900s and 19-teens. Um, there was a uh, more radical um, part of the Social Democrats called the, uh, um, the Independent um, Social Democrats. And they were actually part of this um, uh, tumult in, in, in Munich. But the Social Democrats, they've, they've always been progressives, but one of the really, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine for the, the journalists in the audience here. So the social democrats, these, these, these editors, were just committed, uh, as I said, to these progressive values, to standing up not just for um, people, people in labor unions, but for, for human rights. Um, I mean, they would be considered progressives um, in these times, but at the same time, they were party hacks. I mean, they were just, you know, they were, they were, they were partisan people. Um, and it appeared in the, in the newspaper. Every single day the paper was printed. They had this propaganda. But amid the propaganda, they had these stories, and incredible exposés. And behind the exposés of the Nazis was not just party politics, not, trying, not, not just trying to stop Hitler, although that's what they were trying to do, but it really was this commitment that was incredibly rare in Germany during the 1920s, a commitment to, to saving the Weimar um, democracy. Well, uh, and uh, one lesson from your book is that the uh, probably the first newspaper to really um, identify the threat that Hitler posed. And, it did it very early, and uh, could you talk about that? Um, they started reporting on this, um, as near as I can tell, about uh, 1920. Douglas, I don't know if you encountered anything earlier than that. But it, it seems to be about uh, 1920. They started um, reporting um, on, the, um, um, on the Nazis. And actually, the, uh, one of the editors, Edmund uh, Goldschag, um, he became political editor for the Munich Post in 19. 27. And before that, he had worked in uh, Berlin for the um, Social Democrats um, that essentially a wire service in Berlin. And um, Goldschag, um, early on, I think it was about 23 or so, he started writing about 
this guy Adolf Hitler, who was the new leader of the Nazi party. And Goldschlag wrote in this wire service story, it's not the communists who are a threat to freedom. It's the fascists. It's, it's, this, it's this guy, um, Ad Adolf Hitler. Um, make no mistake about it. This is the true threat. Um, and so it's interesting to follow um, Goldschlag's uh, path from there to the Munich, to the Munich Post. Um, and then he became, um, um, uh, he, he was in a, a number of uh, court cases. I think actually he was attacked by, by Nazis uh, at some point. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, and you, you draw in this book uh, very interesting portraits of um, these journalists who, who I think um, have been largely forgotten, even in Germany. Um, uh, Julius Zerfoss, Martin Gruber, Erhard Auer, uh, Edmund Goldschock. And, and you really feel, reading your book, that you get to know each of them and as uh, individuals. But what, among this group, what do you think it is that gave them the courage to keep uh, speaking out against this very violent and dangerous um, uh, uh, party? I don't know. You know, I, I kept asking them that question. What would I do if I were in that situation? I, I, I really don't know. Other than a real um, um, drive to, to save uh, the Weimar Republic. That's, um, and they were, they were obviously committed. Their, their lives were um, um, in danger um, constantly. Um, oh, one, thing, one point I want to make about the, the early days. So something that, uh, um, this is one thing that, uh, one thing that happened in, um, um, 1923, they kept reminding the Munich Post of the um, uh, the dangers of the, the Nazis. There was a uh, um, during the uh, Putsch um, of 1923, um, the Beer Hall Putsch. Yes. Um, so as, as Hitler was uh, was in the Beer Hall uh, trying to um, trying to take power. Um, there was a section of the Sturmabteilung who got in trucks and they, they roared off to um, the, the house of one of the editors of the, um, of the Munich Post and the, uh, the editor wasn't there, but they, um, uh, they went inside the house and they ransacked it and uh, um, the editor's grandson, um, toddler, was, was there. Um, and the, the stormtroopers also drove to the, uh, to the Munich Post and they uh, burst through the door there and they... Um, they caused all kind of chaos in there and essentially destroyed um, everything in, inside the office. And the, the, the Post never forgot that. And there are many times uh, during the years to come that they would write something. They would remind people uh, what happened uh, during that, that raid of the, uh, the storm troopers in um, 1923, saying this, what can ha this is what can happen. These are the people that we're, we're dealing with. And uh, they had the famous headline after that, right? Yes, the, the headline, um, so the, uh, the Munich Post was finally shut down um, in uh, March, March 9, uh, 1933. Um, they were suspended for, um, for a couple of days um, just before that. Um, and they came back, um, uh, this is on March 3rd, 1933, came back with the headline, banner headline. Full page headline in, in German, the English translation is, we will not be intimidated. It's just incredible, to and this shows the bravery and the commitment of, of, of the editors. Um, um, and so, that's, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the famous headline. Yeah, and you recount uh, how, you know, the editors would sometimes be jumped as they were getting off their tram cars and beaten up. That's and, right. And, uh, uh, they would, as the Nazis were chasing them around, they would um, come to their houses and and intimidate their uh, uh, their housekeepers to tell them where they were, um, and uh, and it just uh, the rectitude of, of standing up to this uh, terrible virulent force mm -hmm. uh, is, is quite one amazing. Of, one of them actually carried a pistol, and uh, there's there was one uh, one scene in. Um, in the book, as the uh, the editors were on the run, the um, um, the editors, as the, as they were being sought by the by the Nazis, um, they would have um, um, meetings in a um, um, in a pub 
and they dubbed it um, the Sea Palace. Um, so some of the editors met there, but mainly it was uh, social democratic, Munich social democratic leaders would, would meet there as the Nazis were, were looking for them. And uh, they had a, um, um, uh, Erhard Auer, the, uh, the main editor, who was also the, the lead social democrat in Munich at the time, they had an agreement with a, uh, a barmaid um, at, this, at this pub. So the, um, uh, the social democrats would meet behind this heavy, um, heavy curtain. If anybody's ever been to a, uh, a pub in, or a restaurant in Europe, you know what these, these heavy curtains look like. They're meant to keep out the, keep out the cold. So there's this heavy, heavy curtain, and the uh, uh, SPD guys and the editors would meet there, and they had an agreement with the barmaid. Uh, they would tip the barmaid so that uh, if any Nazis came in, she would give them the word, and they'd go out the bar back door and escape through the labyrinth of, of streets. Um, and there was one occasion when uh, they were meeting um, in this back room, and the, um, uh, the curtain was slightly ajar. Uh, the barmaid came, came to them and uh, told them that uh, uh, Heinrich Himmler and Heydrich uh, were, were having wine at a table in the main part of the pub. And they looked through there, and they, they kind of talked amongst themselves about what to do. And one of them did have a gun, and I think that was their heart, our. And they didn't do anything with it. I mean, they could have gone over there and shot him. And, and one of them, his name is uh, Wilhelm um, Hergner, um, he wrote a book um, called Escaping Hitler. And he described this scene, and he, he talked about, he, he speculated to himself about what would have happened if one of us took that pistol, if Erhard Auer, if I took that pistol, or just one of us went over there and shot dead these two guys who were responsible for the Holocaust, uh, Himmler and, uh, and Heydrich, what would that have done? And, um, and sadly, Hergner said probably nothing at all. But when you think about it, what that would have done was it would have probably caused a civil war. Um, the um, uh, um, SA um, um, would have gone up um, against parts of the, the populace that was support, um, supporting the Social Democrats. There would have been, um, there would have been civil war. The, the Social Democrats at the time, they had a uh, paramilitary organization uh, called the, the Reichsbahnet. Um, and it was supposedly just a defense organization. They, they uh, acted as security at social democratic rallies to, uh, to keep Nazis away. Um, and they weren't supposed to have arms. Um, and uh, so if they did go up against stormtroopers, the, um, the Reichsbanner, they, you know, they, they didn't have the weapons to, to do it. Well, well, the Munich Post got under Hitler's skin very early, as we discussed, because they were writing about uh, the Nazi party all through the 1920s, 30s. And um, when he finally becomes chancellor in January 1933, maybe you could describe what happened to the, to the Munich Post then. Um, so after, after that, the, um, um, Hitler created uh, uh, a propaganda ministry, and he, and he started putting in the, uh, the building blocks for uh, taking control of, uh, of the media. Um, and uh, most, um, there are a lot of newspapers, uh, mainstream newspapers, who really didn't take Hitler seriously at the time. They thought he was, uh, they thought it was a joke. They really didn't think he was going to go anywhere in, um, in politics. Um, and so a lot of papers really didn't write that much about the Nazis until um, the violence, the street violence started getting really bad in the, um, uh, in the early 1930s. Um, and, and so, as I said, the Hitler started putting in the building blocks for taking control of the, of the press, even before the Reichstag fire, but especially after the Reichstag uh, fire, um, uh, shutting down, uh, completely banning, first banning the uh, communist newspapers. And there are a lot of communist newspapers. It was a very partisan um, uh, environment in the, uh, in the newspaper landscape uh, in Germany. Um, and, and so they just started shutting, shutting them down, and uh, um, gradually they just started shutting, shutting, they just would shut them down permanently. And quite violently. Quite violently. It was not only the Munich Post that was attacked, although they got it worse than any newspaper that, that I've been able to discover. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened then, um, well, let me, first before I ask you that, so the we, uh, Munich Post, which Hitler liked to call the Munich Pestilence, um, uh, stood out for its opposition. But what were, what were the rest of the journalists in Germany doing at this time? Were they going along? Were they uh, encouraging um, 
this so the reference? the media landscape is um um so there were there were newspapers that were kind of like the um the um german versions of the new york times like um um, there are a couple of newspapers in, in Berlin, and they're they're read by the um, the elites, and they were kind of the opinion makers in Germany um, at the time. But out in rural areas, um, people didn't read papers like that so much. There are a lot of local um, newspapers that were focused really on on local concerns. Some of them were like gossip rags, um, and, and there was a uh, huge um, media. Um, Concern. It was called. It was owned by uh, uh, Hugenberg, H-U-G-E-N-B-E-R-G, and he was an ultra nationalist. And uh, um, they wrote articles. And they operated very much like um, like a wire service. Um, they would write um, these um, these articles uh, that were um, uh, right wing extremist, uh, ultra, ultra nationalist, and they would get published um, in these little newspapers out in the provinces. And that's what people read. Um, and uh, there were some, obviously, the social democratic press um, uh, opposed the uh, opposed the Nazis, um, but there, there there wasn't this, um, uh, and and this is kind of the problem in Germany at at the time. There what there wasn't this these these waves of opposition um, in the in the press to to what was happening um, politically. Mm -hmm. So most of them stood aside or even applauded as as Hitler consolidated power. Waited, you know. Uh -huh. There was there was a lot of um, in um, a couple of books that that I read about uh, uh, newspapering in, in Germany at the time. Um, there there are a lot of uh, newspapers. They're they're writing pieces um, saying, and these tended to be um, uh, uh, newspapers right in the middle, uh, some conservative um, newspapers, and um, they were saying things like, um, "Oh, let's give this fella Hitler a chance." We'll be able to rein him in. Oh, he's just a fool. We'll be able to control him when he gets power. If he gets power, why worry about it? He's no problem. He's just an idiot. Um, so there was, there was a lot of that. Uh -huh. um, well, uh, getting back to some of these journalists, maybe you could describe their journeys uh, after Hitler took power and after the, the newspaper was shut down. How did they... Uh, how did they cope? Um, they were all on the run uh, for um, for weeks at a time, and they hid out in uh, um, uh, the um, houses of uh, of colleagues. Um, and um, they would pop up occasionally. There's, um, there were about six of them showed up um, at an arbitration court, a Munich arbitration court, um, a couple of weeks after the newspaper was shut down. Um, showed up in an arbitration, arbitration court, and they were so poor that they wanted to get their back pay. I mean, you know, it seems kind of like, aren't you asking for trouble by doing this? But anyways, they showed up at this, uh, at this arbitration court and asking for the back pay. And there was a uh, um, uh, police officer who was there, and the, the judge was sympathetic to, uh, to the Nazis. And the police officer says to the... Uh, Editors, well, this is all all very convenient that you happen to happen to be here. I stopped to the police station with you. So uh, they all got arrested. <laughs> they all got arrested. Yeah. Um, the um, uh, so uh, there's one who went to uh, was sent to Dachau, Julius Zerfas, uh, um, who was um, uh, my favorite all, of all of them. He was a uh, a poet, uh, very modest guy, very um, very soft spoken, very very sensitive. A former person. gardener. Former gardener, that's right, yeah. Um, and he was arrested a couple of times, and uh, his, in his last arrest, he was sent to uh, Dachau, I think, for six months. And he actually wrote a, um, uh, a novel about Dachau. He wrote it under an alias, Walter Hornung, in 1937. Um, and uh, he never really described um, his own experiences there, but he described Dachau through the eyes of... Uh, fictional characters, and he didn't name any any real prisoners there to to protect them and, the, mm -hmm. um, and their families. And the um, and also, I thought there was the sad, uh, ironic story of Paul Kossman, who uh, who helped Hitler and or helped uh, Hitlerite thinking. Right. And paid a big price. Yeah, right. and Douglas can help me if I get off the tracks here with this thing because this, <laughs> this is especially. Um, so, so um, 
uh, Kosman had a, um, uh, a magazine um, that was started in the 19-teens, correct? Um, and it was a very good literary uh, magazine. Uh, um, Thomas Mann had written, written for it. Um, but it, after, um, um, so Kosman, the magazine became an apologist, became a big supporter of um, German imperialism and, uh, and of World War I. And after um, the war, uh, Kosman um, published um, uh, two editions of the magazine um, in which he uh, promoted um, an idea um, that um, uh, the Germans could have won World War I if the, the, the generals were allowed to continue to fight. And his argument, um, the argument of these, these articles was that Germany's loss was caused by the Social Democrats who, were, who, were, who uh, were in power just after the war, and also by the Jews, of course, um, and Jews among the Social Democrats. So um, this, uh, the magazine propagated this, and um, uh, the um, Munich Post wrote um, it was called the stab in the back. Yeah. It was called the stab in the back. Yeah, the, and the idea being that Germany was stabbed in the back by the Social Democrats and by and by Jews. Um, and um, so the Munich Post uh, wrote um, a couple of articles um, saying that this is a falsification of of history. This is um, uh, this is fake news. Um, and uh, so Kosman took offense um, at this, and he sued uh, the, the Munich Post. And uh, the, the result of this lawsuit with this huge trial in, um, in, in Munich, um, where the judge um, ruled that um, Kosman actually did, um, his facts were wrong, but he, um, that the Post also had slandered um, Kosman. Is that correct? Douglas, um, and so they, um, and, and that um, that ruling by a Bavarian judge was pretty uh, uh, commonplace. That that kind of ruling, in f in favor of ultranationalist figures um, and authoritarian, authoritarian figures um, and Nazis, um, was um, yeah it was pretty pretty common in, uh, in Munich during those days. Yeah, I, that was, I found that striking in the book. The number of times that the Munich Post would write about the Nazis and then be taken to court by the Nazis uh, and, uh, you know, um, maybe winning some moral victories against the Nazis, but they usually ended up being fined by the judges, which seemed to be sympathetic to... The, the, uh, po the Post didn't always get it, get it right. And sometimes they're amusing in their, in their reporting. I was telling my friend Tony last night, there's one um, court case, like 1927 or so, and there was a... Um, uh, there was a, an arm of the, the Nazi party, and it was, um, uh, and they were responsible for going out and buying uniforms for the uh, for the SA um, and and the SS, and so they would find German, German suppliers for these uniforms, and they would, then they would actually sell them to the SS and the SA, and they weren't supposed to be making any profit from it. However, the Munich Post, through whatever sources they had at the time, I'm not sure I can't even able to trace the do the documents that, that they got. Um, they discovered um, that um, um, that the, the head of this organization uh, was cooking the books, and he was stealing money from the Nazis, the people that he was, he was supposedly working for. Um, and so the uh, um, the Post wrote about that, and and one of the articles with um, right in the, the 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 Munich Post had the timing of a stand-up comic occasionally in their articles. Right in the middle of this article, where they're just describing how the uniforms were purchased, the Munich Post, whoever wrote this, wrote, and now comes the best part. <laughs> One of the suppliers was the Jew. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and one of their other, um, uh, um, they actually won that lawsuit. The, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the attorney who was uh, representing the um, uh, the Nazi, who was deeply offended, um, he, when he learned the truth, he just he backed out of the case. He just he, he didn't pursue. Um, there's another um, funny one that the Post had um, discovered that a uh, a Nazi and a communist um, were uh, were trying to um, 
purchased the same prostitute. And the, the headline uh, was beautiful. It, it read, uh, so, the, so the German um, uh, shorthand uh, for communists is Kotzi, and Nazis, of course, a Nazi. So the headline was uh, uh, Nazi and Kotzi united in love. <laughs> it was great. They lost that case. <laughs> But uh, Paul Kossman, who uh, sort of promulgated the idea of the stab in the back and, and went to court to defend the idea, how did, how did he end up then? Uh, um, so so Kossman um, was born to a Jewish family. He um, converted to Catholicism in 1914 um, or so. Um, he's a very religious um, fellow. Um, he, um, uh, in the, um, the, the 40s, he, um, because he was Jewish, he was arrested and he was sent to a, um, uh, um, a camp um, in the Munich area. And from there, he was sent to um, uh, Theresienstadt. Um, and he, um, um, he died of, I think, TB in, um, in uh, uh, Theresienstadt. And there was some, um, a couple of prisoners, uh, I think one was at the Munich camp and one was at Theresienstadt, and there was an, uh, an attorney and a prisoner. And they actually talked with uh, Kussmann before um, he died. And he, re he had regretted, Kussmann had, had regretted um, in his conversations with these two um, that he had helped Hitler um, in, in any way. Um, but he still, he, he held to his um, Catholicism. It was, it was, th that was a thing that kind of kept, kept him, him stable to the, to the mm -hmm. very end. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it, it's um, such a fascinating story, and I think you've uncovered so much. And, uh, and any plans for a German edition of this book? It seems like it would be something to... Uh, Peter left just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, come back. It seems like it would be a good case for... Uh, um, uh, explaining to the German public a, a bit more about these these people who have been. I, I have. I hope to. Uh -huh. Yeah, I hope to. And um, just uh, to end on a more positive note, uh, after the war, how how did the spirit of the Munich Post? How was it revived? Uh, um, I guess I'm thinking about uh, uh, Edmund Goldschock. And, oh uh, yeah. Um, so one of the editors, uh, the political editor, um, Edmund Goldschag, he, um, um, he um, was living in uh, Freiburg at the, at the end of the war. Um, and the uh, Americans, when the Americans entered um, Bavaria, they wanted to start up uh, um, new newspapers with uh, American newspapers as, uh, as a model, uh, New York Times as a, as a model. And um, so they went around looking for editors um, who weren't tainted, and they, they um, started up a, uh, um, a card catalog um, in, um, in Munich. And there was a special team, an American uh, um, army team, and they were at this, at this office, and uh, they would look through the card catalogs. Um, they would hop in their Jeeps, and they, they'd cruise the countryside uh, looking for um, some untainted editors. There are an awful lot of people who applied for jobs, and they were, they were rejected um, because of their, their Nazi past. Um, but they came on um, uh, Edmund Goldschag. He was living in uh, Fry Freiburg uh, at the time. He was working for uh, an office that uh, handed out um, uh, uh, food stamps uh, to people who was helping keep the, the populace fed there. So the uh, American, four Americans um, uh, rolled up um, in, a, um, in a Jeep in, in Freiburg and they talked to them. And Goldschag at first um, uh, was reluctant to become an editor again, he, and he told the Americans, he said, you know, it was a really difficult time for me. And um, in Munich, they, they shut down my paper. It's been, it was difficult for me to deal with. Give me a couple of weeks to think it over. So they went back after a couple of weeks and offered the job to him again. And, the, and, the, and he took it. So he ended up being one of the yeah. uh, founders, one of the four uh, founders of the Süddeutsche Zeitung, which is one of the best papers um, in, in Germany. One of the best papers in the world, really. It's, um, it's still it's thriving. Süddeutsche. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the title of your book, uh, Enemy of the People, uh, did you have anything special in mind when you chose that title? <laughs> <laughs> S 
so um question um, so first I will say that in uh, um, June of 1933 uh, the Hitler regime adopted a resolution um, an edict issued an edict uh, declaring that social Democrats um, and in the opposed to the environment of social Democrat party that social Democrats uh, were um, enemies of people in the state. But, um, to be honest, um, so um, Amazon and some other outlets became interested in what I was doing um, shortly after uh, uh, President Trump started making comments about the news media. Um, and so there were you know, some people who knew that I was working on this, and, and Amazon um, approached me. Um, but not with that title in mind. And this was for the ebook, so I submitted the, the ebook, and the editor came back to me and said, and the title was originally Taunting Hill. And the, the Taunting, Taunting Hill. Um, and the, um, he said, well, what about the, the title on any of the people? I said, well, that's provocative. He said, well, don't you want to do what's provocative? Um, so I thought about it. I said, yes, yeah, let's, let's go with it. It, it resonates and it, it really it really makes you think about what an enemy of the people is. It made me think about what an enemy of the people is. And I have to be honest, um, circling back to the 1920s, um, this idea of an enemy of the people um, made me ask myself what I would have done as a journalist um, during, during those times. Who to me would have been the enemy of the people? So that's a long answer. Very appropriate one. Why did you um, get into Amazon instead of getting it? You went through Amazon instead of getting like a literary agent and doing, I know the AP, they, they went out. But do you f feel, I mean, was there, because you missed out on a bidding war and you, I don't know if you got an advance, but how, what was that experience like? And did, you know, so I had an agent who um, went around the, the world for about a year, and there was some mild interest in it, but not a lot of interest. Um, and so then, uh, yeah, Amazon um, approached us, and there, there are others as well. Um, and I thought, well, a lot of people are going to read an ebook about this. Um, you know, this, this, I consider it works for like this now. Um, Chris and I, my wife and I, spent hours at the New York Public Library today, and we said to ourselves, the world has to be like this. <laughs> uh, like a library, like a, like a bookstore. Um, but I went with them because I thought people were not. Um, and uh, I was interested in the, the comments which that we've done. Um, that would be provoked uh, provoked by this. Um, so that's that's really why. And because, has it sold a lot of ebooks? You know, I, I, I don't know. Oh, um, okay. I, I, I can't I can't get those numbers. Um, uh, there's a lot of comments about it. Um, it's, it's been a bestseller um, in uh, numerous categories, um, seven or eight different categories. Um, interest has it died off um, a little bit during the past couple months. Um, is that Answer your question. Yeah, yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, we have time for some more questions from the floor. So. What about Germany? I mean, is, it, is the book being published in German? Is it being <coughs> circulated in German? Um, I'm hoping to do that. You know, Marcus, it's, it's very strange. There is not a single German book, a book in German, published by a German publisher about this newspaper. Um, interestingly enough, um, the only complete book I know um, about the newspaper before this one was written by a uh, Brazilian woman who wrote it in Portuguese. And the, the title, I think the title, I don't know Portuguese, but I think the title is The Poison Kitchen. The same, the same The Poison Ki Kitchen, the same title is in that chapter of the uh, uh, meadow book. So, sorry. Marcus, wait, wait for the mic. Oh, okay. It's very interesting. It's, it's puzzling. I mean, I've come across this kind of puzzling stuff happening in European countries. That's my own ignorance. But the, 
very often you find that something that you thought was a burning issue and that everybody was talking about is a non-issue in the country involved. And I'm wondering if this is a surprise to you, because it astonishes me that there wouldn't be at least some interest, especially from media people who are in the business of publicizing this. Is there a guilty conscience at work? Is there a fear that they're going to say, what about you guys? Did you do anything like the Munich po what, what, how do you, Can you explain it? For the first couple of decades um, after the war, people didn't want to talk about the war. Right? And so that was, that was one reason. I mean, not even. Um, not e no, thanks. Um, th so Germany wasn't even interested in, um, in people in the resistance um, until the 60s or so. Um, and so it, it just, yeah, people didn't, they wanted to forget. But there's also something going on um, in the so within the social democrats because they failed. A and I'm just surmising this, Mark, because I really don't know. But just from some things that, I, that I've read, uh, written by social democrats, um, uh, th there's, there's, there's some um, controversy um, within the Social Democrats, no longer, uh, about um, their failure to take up arms against the Nazis. Um, and afterwards. Hmm? Were they, were they about a civil war? Oh, no, Margaret, take the mic. Sorry, I, I'm not going to interrupt. Just carry on. Yeah. Um, so, so that's um, um, so the Social Democrats, and again, I'm just I'm just surmising, um, didn't turn this into something that that glorifies them. And I think because of some guilt and and disagreement, some lingering disagreement among Social Democrats about whether they could have actually stopped. Hitler and there was this uh, the book by um, this terrific book in German uh, called uh, Escaping Hitler by Wilhelm Hugner um, that was not published until 1977 this is 40 years after he wrote it 40 years and the only explanation I can find about that is that the leadership um, well the leadership at first was concerned um, if it was published um, in 37 that it would be used as a propaganda tool um, by the Nazis against the, the Social Democrats. But I suspect um, after that, after that, you know, honestly, people forgot about the Munich Post. Um, people didn't want to talk about those, those times. Um, and another interesting aspect is that there have been, over the past couple of years, um, some books written about some of the people um, involved with the Munich Post. Like there was a, a book that came out two years ago about, about Erhard Auer, um, who was the chief editor, and he was also the leader, Bavarian leader of the Social Democrats. But this was mainly, this was written by um, a professor. Um, very academic book. Um, so it's, it, it, is, it is a puzzle, but those are the answers, only answers that I've been able to find. Any? So uh, <clears throat> you mentioned before that uh, there was a sort of time where a lot of this sort of major newspapers in Germany were kind of equivocating and waiting to figure out wh how they were going to sort of report on Hitler. And I think that kind of is similar to a fairly popular criticism of mainstream media right now, that they're kind of covering right-wing extremism and, and various other sort of dangerous actors uh, as if we're all going to sort of return to a period that's normal and, and, and kind of the way that they sort of always saw things. Is there, especially early on, um, is there sort of any any kind of signal or parallel that, that you can think of, uh, of how media today could maybe do better in, in that regard, or, or lessons that, that maybe some of these bigger media organizations in Germany learned too late? I will leave the parallel to the one you just made. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I think there's some danger um, in trying to draw similarities between uh, the Weimar Republic and uh, um, pretty much any, um, any democracy um, in the 21st century. And I'm, I read about this in, in the book. Um, uh, Germany really didn't have any experience with, uh, with democracy at the time. This is the first true German democracy. Um, and there was an awful lot of resistance um, towards it. Um, 
the United States have 250 some odd years experience with um, democracy. And I'm not saying that there aren't dangers now. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I read the newspapers. Um, uh, so, but, but, but it would kind of, um, for anybody trying to find parallels um, between uh, the Weimar um, Republic and uh, uh, contemporary uh, America, I always tell them, well, read a little bit about it and then just form your own, um, form your own opinion, really. Got time for another question if anyone has one. Do you have another project in mind? Project I, in mind? I, yes, I do. Um, it, this so um, uh, this book is about um, uh, the uh, about Weimar democracy, and the project I've, I'm working on now um, is about um, uh, the immediate years in uh, uh, post-war Germany. Uh, yes, it's about post-war Germany. Specifically, it's it's about um, uh, the hiring of uh, um, people who had who could have been tried as as war criminals if they were investigated, and how they were hired for uh, uh, civil service jobs in um, in West Germany. There are hundreds of them, and most of them most of the names are are not are not known. There are hundreds hundreds of people who were never. Um, brought to justice and instead who were given civil service jobs um, oftentimes with the uh, uh, with the help of um, uh, the um, the OSS and the, and the CIA I mean they were, they were hired originally by the OSS um, or the CIA or taken under their wing and and put into positions where they eventually um, came into power and in, uh, in civil service jobs uh, this is a question for uh, John and, and Terrence um, since you've lived so many places around the world, are you worried about the political future of the world with all these re regimes in place? And well, yes, I think I think uh, everyone should be worried right now because um, uh, one thing that struck me recently is. Um, you know, after uh, the Second World War, in uh, the you know the so-called um, uh, post-war you know compact existed, that they, they set certain uh, uh, guardrails around democracy and norms, and uh, there is you know a strong sense now that uh, some of these uh, guardrails and, and norms are being eroded, and. Uh, uh, you know, I would have to agree with Terry that uh, you you can't make a straight analogy between um, the 1930s in, uh, in Germany and what's happening now. But after World War II, there was uh, there was really a strong effort to keep uh, right wing or fascistic parties from reappearing. And now, you know, in not everywhere, but in a few countries, you see that kind of totalitarian thinking, you know, in Austria, in in, in uh, Italy, and in, in Hungary, uh, in Poland, which I covered very closely, um, and um, you know, Putinism and and uh, Orbanism, all the, all these things uh, give me a, a slight feeling of. Uh, that that we're a little off the rails right now, so. Yeah, yeah like um, I agree with John. Uh, when the 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 Cold War um, ended, we saw this um, the signs of hope for democracy in in Poland and Hungary and across the the former um, Soviet bloc, and um, and you look at it now, and, and and you just have to ask yourself, why are people willing to give up um, their their freedoms? That's something that that puzzles me. Now, um, and it's um, in the book. I I, um, I tussle with that with that question. I mean, why? What, what's the what's the trade-off here? What is why? Why is it worth it to uh, to give up your freedom? Um, but it just does seem to be happening that um, in countries where it's surprising. I mean, even the Soviet Union, when uh, the Soviet Union fell, we thought that they were going to become 
uh, uh, democratic, and uh, we're qu quickly proved wrong about that. But yeah, Hungary, especially in, in Poland, is uh, it's really alarming what's happening there. Right. Yeah, I think in China, you can you know, there there seems to be developing an idea that maybe government needs to have a strong hand in a lot of places, and uh, and this is. Right, and that's where there is a parallel to Germany in the Weimar era, um, because people wanted a strong hand. They wanted they wanted us they wanted a strong arm. They wanted somebody who would uh, take control and uh, and put things put things to right. Thank you, John. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you for coming. Thank in you all the way from Oregon. So, uh, thank you very much. You're going to stick around and you're going to sign copies. And if anybody wants to purchase some, there's a cash register right there. Thank you all for coming.